So, my name is John Atkinson, I'm the editor of Sterefile. I'll be, be celebrating my 32nd anniversary of joining Sterefile on May the 1st. Before that, I was the editor of Hi-Fi News magazine. And it suddenly struck me when I was asked to give a keynote presentation for this year's show. This is the 50th anniversary of when I got my first system. So, it's... That's me. <laughs> That's me at age 12. No leaf ears. Those are audiophile ears. I didn't know it then, but they were going to be an asset instead of an embarrassment. Okay, so that was me at 12. At, at 16, I joined my first band. That's me on the left, playing the bass guitar. And my parents were musical. And at school, they had this wonderful program, which I don't think anybody does anymore. We had compulsory listening to music as part of the curriculum. And once a week, we would go to the music teacher's room. He'd have a system there. It was a link sandwich speaker, a link point one mono amplifier, and he'd play us records. And we listened to Holst Mars, we listened to Sibelius' Finlandia, we listened to Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. We were 14, 15, 16 year old kids, but we were being exposed to this wonderful music and also on great sound, mono as it was, but the school felt it important that we did that. So, music, parents' musical, school insisted on music. I played the violin from 12 onwards, I sung in school choirs, and 1964 joined my first band to play rock and roll. And then, once I went off to college, used my grant money in England, we were all given, students were given money, instead of spending it on books and subsistence and so on, I bought my first system. So, Wharfdale Super Linton, Linton speakers, I don't know if you ever remember them, they have like this purple octopus tweeter. Uh, a Kenwood 2000 amplifier, or actually it was, in England it was called Trio, but it was the same thing. And my turntable, the Garrard SP25 Mark II, which I got an Audio Technica 600 cartridge on. And this was just wonderful. I, you know, it's like, finally I had my own system. And back then, in 68, music was exploding. We were so spoiled. Every week there'd be a new album we had to buy. Electric Ladyland from Jimi Hendrix, after Bathing of Baxter's by Jefferson Airplane. They just creams wheels on fire. Every week there was a great groundbreaking album release. And we had the system to play the recordings on. We had all these great recordings. We had maybe a little bit of herbal cigarette help to help us enjoy it. And we, it was all hands on. And my best friend at that time was putting together speakers He'd buy a Wharfdale 8 inch unit and put it in a box. And we'd go and listen. Well, something's missing. And then he had the brainwave. You know, I've got tweeters. So we'd go around and listen to him having tweeters. And it was such fun, such involvement in both audio and music. I was playing in bands. Um, that's me on, on the right there. We were doing a lot of gigs. I was working out that while I was in college, I was actually doing up to 200 gigs a year playing in bands and I was playing with lots of different bands that's me playing in a band we did we did show tunes and cover stuff and but I was earning all that money so what did I spend that money on I upgraded my system so Cospro 4A headphones, those were recommended. I never did understand what the little thing on the bottom left was for. I said, if you put it on a mic stand, well, then you'd be like that. Um, swap the trio, can work for a Sony app, which I got the matching tuner, but the most, it, and then started fiddling around with cassettes. That's a Wharfdale deck I bought. Uh, had an Akimichi transport. It's all, you know, cassettes, well, this is the new thing. Uh, but the most important purpose, I'd worked out for myself that the Garrard was a horrible turntable. And if it was horrible, everything it did wouldn't be made better by, ever, by the Ample speakers. So I bought a Thorum's TD-150 AB, um, fitted it with a Shure M75 EJ cartridge, and was, wow, the turntable makes a big difference. This is, you know, this is four years before I ever met either Tifa or Lynn, who said the same thing. So, a bit of biography, so I went to college, 
graduated with a bachelor's degree in science, and then joined a research lab doing bucket, bucket chemistry, mining chemistry, and probably the only audio reviewer who's both worked down a mine and panned for gold. So, but at the same time, I was still playing in bands. And this was in 72, I gave up the research job, went on the road with a number of bands. This is Carol Pegg, who was the big folk rock star at that time, so I did some gigs with her. I also rode it for their band. i never forget, we were driving to a gig in the Midlands in England, and I'm driving, bands in the back, we get all pulled over by the police. And the police says, got any drugs? And I say, of course we don't have any drugs, officer. You can search anywhere you like, just, you know, we're, we're clean. And so, policeman said, okay, off you go, off you go, lads. Turned out we had a whole stash of marijuana in the glove compartment I didn't know about. <laughs> so, so I was gigging, and then we, we signed the band, which was like the drummer in that picture and myself, we teamed up with a guitarist, and we signed to DJM Records, and we made an album. But we weren't making any money from recording, so we toured with Helen Shapiro, teen singing sensation. We worked with her all through 73, 74, early 75. And again, we, we played everywhere, and that's us on a TV show in 1974. And I, I called my mum, I said, Mum, Mum, BBC TV tonight, 7 o'clock, turn it on. I'm going to be on television. And she says, well, that's all very nice job, but when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> so, I'm gigging a lot, not actually spending a lot of time home playing the system. And um, the album came out, we got great reviews, and no one bought it. And then my then wife, this was in 76, said, you read Hi-Fi News? And I said, yes, I read Hi-Fi News magazine, because when you're on the road or you're in the truck, you've got to read something. And Hi-Fi News was one of the few magazines which had enough stuff to keep you busy for several hours in the truck. She said, well, they're advertising for an assistant editor. And you read it, why don't you apply? So I applied, and I called the number, and John Crabb, who was the editor himself, answered the phone. I was like, oh, oh. He said, no, come in. So went in for an interview, and they said, okay, you know, you have to write three pieces, two record reviews and one news item, and then we'll see if you're good enough. So I wrote the three pieces, I remember one of them was a review of Pacina's in Tritico, which I didn't know at all, but I, I, did, I did know Pacina's Love OM, so I kind of winged it. Anyway, I got the job. I joined Hi-Fi News, my, my dream magazine, and I got a job. And finally, I was earning enough money to pay my mortgage. And then years later, Paul Messenger, who was the deputy editor at that time, and who still writes for Stereophile, and a peculiar twist of fate, is married to my second wife, he said, you know, we actually like the other guy more, but he couldn't spell. So I got the job, which changed my life, because I could spell. And I thought I'd just show you, I appear with two covers in a magazine. Um, on the left, I'm playing with a viola de gamba and, and, a, and a viola de bracket and a right double bass. And anyway, this was my dream job, because my education was in science. My passion was for music. And sometime in the early 70s, when I was not playing as many gigs as I was, I actually got a teaching diploma as a high school science teacher. And the three things went together. The music, because I love music, always had a passion for music. The science, because audio is a scientific subject. Whoops. And the teaching, because being a journalist, being a writer, being an editor, you're actually teaching. You're, in, you're, you're giving hard information to people. You have to wrap it in a sugar coat. They have to enjoy what they're reading. But nevertheless, it's factually based science. So everything came together. I joined Hi-Fi News. Up to that point, I'd always bought components. After that point, I actually used to borrow stuff. And that was, those were the two big things I bought after I joined Hi-Fi News. Gale 401 speakers. Ira Gale, I'd met at shows, he was a complete character. But this speaker was the first real speaker I heard which actually you know, did something I hadn't heard before, which was dynamic range, which was stereo. And I bought a Quad 303 amp to drive it because growing up in England in the early, late 60s, early 70s, we venerated Quad. You know, they were the brand. So that's what I bought. 
a mistake. It sounded horrible. <laughs> so, my system, next system, I upgraded all that. I bought a Lexum AC1 and an AT1X, designed by Bufroyd Stewart, but by the time I bought it, it was Stan Curtis who, who was doing the design. Um, LS358s, I bought a pair. Oh my goodness, the stereo imaging, the things that hung solidly in space. I've never heard that, that good before, even from the Gales. But then the big change, I told you I'd got a Florence. Well, I'd met Ivor Tiefenbrunn at a high five show in the fall of 76. I walked into a room and said, Hi, Mr. Tiefenbrunn, I'm John Atkinson, I've just joined Hi Fi News. And he said, Get out of my room! You know, because we, Hi Fi News, just published a review of the Lynn, compared it negatively against the Ariston RD11, and had poo pooed the whole idea of turntables making some kind of difference. So, I bought a Lynn instead from Julian Vereker of Maine. And I, there it's got a Nitok on it. When I bought it, I put an SME 3009 Series 4 on it. Um, went for a lot of cartridges. Um, tried, my favorite was the Dynamax Ruby with a tiny little diamond cantilever, um, which I destroyed because I hadn't realized that with movie core cartridges, they have really strong magnets in them. So if you put it down on the bench next to another movie core magnet, they go <coughs> And of course, they always hit cantilevers first. <laughs> so, so that was the system in 78. The Lynn was a, was a huge improvement. I really was a believer in turntables making a difference. The Rogers LS 358s, I bought them, I still have them. It's, it's, I mean, I, I, every speaker I measure for the magazine, I also measure this 78 pair of Rogers LS 358s, just to make sure I'm measuring the right things, that something hasn't gone wrong. And then, disaster happened. I took part in some blind listening tests with Martin Collins as the moderator. We were comparing amplifiers blind. We couldn't tell the difference. They were all the same. So I thought, well, I'll sell the Lexons, which were, I got a good price for, and I'll buy a Quad 405, because that was the one in the listening test we couldn't tell from any of the others. And then my system was like, I stopped enjoying the music. I, you know, I put on record, Hmm. Oh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'm not feeling in the mood for that record. I'll put on another record. No, that's not doing it. So I go to bed. And after a while, I thought, well, you know, the big change I made was just the amplifier. I got rid of the Lexons. I got the quads. The quad 405 and the quad preamp. And, well, something's wrong. So I decided I would relegate the quad to driving my guitar, my bass guitar stack. And I got the Michelson and Robson TVA 10, four EL34s in push pull, and the magic came back. All I'd done was replace the power amplifier, the solid state cord with the tube Michelson and Austin, and oh, it all came back again. I still, I still have the Michelson and Austin. It's in a box in the storage room. Um, and then at the same time, I borrowed a pair of four ESLs. What, what we now call BSL 57s, and everything I liked about the Rogers LS 35A, the stereo imaging, the reproduction of voice, was, in, was reproduced in spades by the electrostatic quads. And, oh, that was such a great time. Except the quads, they're not very room friendly, so I replaced them with Celestian SL6s, which I, we reviewed very favorably, and I, so I bought a pair. And then I stopped playing around with preamps and I bought a Meridian 101, which was the first preamp to use what was then new, the Signetics any 5534 op amp chip, which I if you now people sneer at it, but it's still actually in use. The um, the um, Prism Sound Kalia DAC that I reviewed in the uh, which the April issue was it yeah the April issue or was it the May issue ah April I just I get confused there's so many issues pouring out. That still uses that same chip, and I love the Meridian 101. Then, I thought, you know, it's a tiny little box, and it has a tiny little toroidal in it. So I asked Bob Stewart, could you send me an empty chassis? So he sent me an empty chassis, and I bought the biggest toroidal I could fit in that chassis, and powered the 101 from a separate power supply. Much bigger power supply than you think you need. And the sound was better. Who knew? Power supplies matter. I, that, was a, that was a moment of Satori. So, system at that point, Lynn turntable, Microsoft lost in pre power amp, Meridian 101 preamp, Celestian LSO 6s. I still have all that stuff. I never sell anything. But then, 
I got, became aware of what was happening in the United States. This was uh, actually just backing, backing, it, backing up a little bit. I reviewed the Krell KSA 50 amplifier in 1983. Hi-Fi News is August 1983 issue. And that amplifier did something I'd never heard before, which was the iron control of the bass, the superbly detailed, natural, stable stereo imaging. And there was something about it that I loved. So, okay, there's something going on in high-end audio in the States, which maybe we're missing out on in, in England. So, I then reviewed the Audio Research SP10 preamplifier, which, again, it was, what is going on? There's something really special. The Meridian got relegated to the storage, and I stayed with the SP10. There was some, you know, it's tubes, and it burned through tubes, ECC 83 is like no business. But nevertheless, or is it, no, ECC 88. But it, when, it was, when it was not burning up tubes, it sounded great. And then I replaced the SLS and SL6s with the SL600s. Same size speaker, almost the same drive units, but in an aero lamp box, really lightweight enclosure. System was wonderful. And then I got a call from Larry Archibald, publisher of Stereofy. November 85, I'd met him at parties. Stereofy used to have infamous parties at CES shows. And he said, you know, I've been watching what you've been doing with Hi-Fi News. And I said, well, yeah, because I became the editor of Hi-Fi News in October 82. I was subsequently told by the, by the CEO of the company that they did that it's as a wild gamble instead of closing it because the magazine was failing. And in three and a half years, I would almost doubled its circulation. So Larry Archibald said, well, can you come over to the United States and do the same for me? And I said, hmm, OK, let me think about it. Put the phone down and started packing. So, <laughs> So, May 1986, I cross the Atlantic, arrive at Albuquerque Airport. You know, reason for visits are uh, vacation. Um, and I joined Gordon Holt on the, on the right in that picture. Gordon had sold Stereophile to Larry in 1982, had stayed on as editor, but Gordon was not the most hardworking of men. If you look at um, his publication schedule, it was like once a year, or twice a year. No, let's do once a year. So my, my job when I joined Stereophile, I would take over the actual running of the magazine, the editorial department, and although Gordon remained on as a nominal editor, I would actually do the work. Larry Archibald had had a plan that we would go monthly, which we did in October 87. We would go to a large format size, we planned to do it in January 1993, and in the end we did it in January 1994. And we just, did, I did the magazine I wanted, which was to combine subjective reviews with measurements. Because when I was reading Hi-Fi News in the mid 60s, late 60s, that's what they did. And that was what I grew up on. You had to have the two together, the experiential reporting and the measurements. And my system pretty much stayed the same until the early 90s when I started being impressed by what companies like Mark Levinson were doing with digital. So I bought a number 30 after we reviewed it, had, had upgraded to 30.5, upgraded to 30.6, bought a number 31.5 transport to drive it. CD sounded fantastic. There was a solidity to the low frequencies from that combination, which I rarely heard since. Um, the system. I, by then, I think a lot of system churn products going through the system to be reviewed. And by 98, I bought a pair of Mark Medicine number 33H amps, which I loved. And I reviewed the BMW Silver Signatures in, in June 94. And they did everything I wanted from the speaker. They had the stereo of the quads and the LS35As. They had they Obviously not deep bass, but what bass they had was beautifully tight and controlled, very well defined. So that was my system by 98 when Larry and I sold Stereophile to Peterson Publishing. It was all the way through this, I've been buying equipment. I, I buy the things I want to keep and use as much as I possibly can. Because I think it's so easy for reviewers and editors to get stuff on loan. And I, I'd much prefer to own the stuff. I kept on playing, um, I don't play so much now, I did one gig a year, but I still play. Music is, live music is still very important to me. And 
just recently, last year, or two years ago, dragged out the KSA 50, which I had bought in 1983, had it converted to run on 110 volts when I came here. And John DeVore was holding a screening of the movie Forbidden Planet, which is where Dan D'Agostino got the name Krell from. So I took along the Krell KSA 50, you can just see it on the, on the middle of the picture, because I thought that'd be appropriate to show the movie. <laughs> And I measure speakers. I've measured 800 pairs of speakers since 1989. And it's kind of, that's what I love doing. I find speakers, it's like a detective story. You know, you get them up on the stand, you put the mic in front of them. What are they doing? How are they doing it? What does this mean? You know, how come a designer didn't notice that the speaker whistles a tune at 800 hertz every time you play a piano recording? So that, that's my passion. That, that's, I just put that slide up because it, I'm measuring the um, vivid G, Spirit G1 speakers at my reviewer John Iverson's place in Central California, and he just has this wonderful listening room. So you can you can see the hills outside his room, outside his window. And I've been. This is the system. My my go-to system. No no power amplifiers. I'm still trying to decide on power amplifiers. But I bought a pair of Kev LS50s because they do everything the BMWs do and are better. I have bought a pair of Odyssey LCDX headphones. That's my go-to headphone for headphone listening. Back in 2005, I bought an Air CX-5 SACD player, which is still the best SACD player I have, except now I kind of use it as a CD transport most of the time. And my most recent purchase was a PS Audio Direct, Direct Street DAC, which I bought a bridge card to go with it, so I now have it hooked up on my network and I feed it files from my NAS drive over the network and control everything with room, which I really like. But if I actually go back and play CDs on the air and feed the digital output to the PS audio, it actually still sounds better than the network audio. It's just such a pain to have to go and change CDs. So. That's where I'm at. That's a brief history of my systems over the last 50 years and how I've been putting together systems to get what I need from my music, to get that feeling. You know, you know how it is when you play an album and it's 11 o'clock at night and you go, well, maybe just one more. And, and you just stay, and oh my goodness, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. You're like, you know, and, and it's, just, it's just getting, in, my music is getting inside me. And it's why I'm an audiophile, why I've been an audiophile for 50 years, and why I've bought or put together all these systems to reproduce that feel of. I mean, Bill Lowe from AudioQuest said it best. He said, What do we do as audiophiles? We're trying to create the very first time we heard a great recording on a great system, and that's, that's the passion we have. So, questions. Anything that you know you, you'd like me to, to, to answer, any problems you have with the magazine, any things you want to know about the magazine or the industry. Yeah, the the um, the Microsoft or Austin amp was magic in the mid range, but it never had that grip in the bass. It was always a bit sort of bloomy, lousy, and so. I've been, look, I've been looking for solid state amps because that's how you get that bass performance that rival tube amps in the mid range. Um, as an engineer, I get very impatient with single ended tube amps because to me, they're tone controls. They have a bent transfer function, they produce large amounts of second harmonic distortion, which sounds, makes it sound fat, makes it sound sweet, but it's not neutral. <laughs> It's a tone control, so I don't have a lot of patience with single-ended tubes. There's, there's um, traditional tube amps, audio researchers come to mind, um, which do pretty good bass and still have that magic mid-range. VTLs have good bass, but these are all traditional push-pull tube amps. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking for a solid-state amp with tube mid-range, and I haven't found it yet. So, uh, first, congratulations on your long history with the magazine. Oh, thank you. Thank you. 
Well, I, I, when, I, when they asked me to speak, and I said I would also end by talking about the state of the market, and of course I haven't done that. The CD is a commodity. You know, it's 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 valueless in itself. What's about what's worth anything is in what's encoded on the disc. But there's only one CD store left that I shop from, which is Amazon. And um, LP, I have a large collection of LPs, and I play them occasionally. But actually, most of the time now, I rip them to digital at 24, 192, because then I can play them with Rune without having to get up and do anything. And I'm probably means I'm an old fart by doing that, because I know so many young people are into LP because of the experience, the ritual of putting it on, large format sleeve, that's all building to the experience, whereas I've been there, done that, I just want ease at my age. Um, the big change, and I haven't come to grips with it at all, is streaming. I mean, no one's buying music anymore, they're renting it. And I'm sort of in an awkward position because I have a Tidal subscription, I listen to stuff on Tidal, and if I really like it, I go and buy the CD from Amazon. And that's kind of peculiar because I can always still get it on Tidal. So why do I do that? I don't know, maybe it's because I started record collecting in, you know, when I was a teenager and that's what I do, I'm a collector, I have stuff. I, I don't know how many of you guys are collectors or if you're, I don't know, we all have stuff and yeah. that's what we do. I don't know if millennials do that, my children do. Yeah. They haven't bought music in years, they stream it on their phone despite my best endeavours to get them to listen to good quality, they're not interested. So, People that subscribe to magazines always want to get them before their buddies get them. Yeah. And for years, I was always in competition with my <laughs> friend Ted here, and he would get his stereo file at least two to three weeks before I did. I was so mad after a couple of years of that, I wrote you a letter. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I said, you know, how are we going to change this? You sent me an email back and you said, look, I'm in England right now. I'm on a job. But when I get back to the States, I'm going to change your name. My name's Dennis German. So he changed it, my subscription to German Dennis. <laughs> and from that point on, I get my magazine two weeks before he does. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so... Well, I would recommend the Odyssey LCDXs because that's what I bought. Um, I have a pair of Sennheiser 650s which are very good and a lot less expensive. Um, by the way, Jana Dagdagan, who creates our videos, is sitting right here in the front row, so stand up Jana and take a bow. I don't go to live music concerts nearly as much as I used to. Um, I mean, it, it's when, when, I, when I was in my 30s, I would go to two classical concerts a week. Now, one classical concert every three months. And it's partly because of where I live. It's, it's um, to get into to, to, to Manhattan, to go to Carnegie or to the, or Kennedy or that, or, or, or the Lincoln Center. It's an hour and a half subway ride back at night, and I really would have to watch, really would have to want to see the performer and the music. And so much programming classical music these days is, is routine. They, everyone's playing the same. So, am I going to go to Carnegie Hall to see a mile or two, or shall I just play it at home in comfort where there's no audience coughing and I don't have an hour and a half subway ride? Jazz, I love jazz. But, you know, they play so late and on school nights. And, you know. <laughs> um, where do I find new music? Well, it's kind of an, admission, an embarrassing admission that these days I play mostly the music that I love in my collection. 
it's a rare recording that comes along that I let into my life. Um, maybe that's because I'm 70 years old, but you know, I, I, time is so precious. I go into the listening room, I have, I have a, my whole basement is, 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 is now my listening room. It's my, my space. I go there, I thought, okay, I've got two hours. Do I play something new or do I play something that I know is going to give me that rush? So I do get recommendations from friends. Um, I do. Stephen Mejias, when he worked for me, was a really good um, sort of uh, a gatekeeper. Listen to this, he'd say, and he was almost always right. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm typical anymore just because of my age. Uh, class D. We reviewed the PS Audio Stella 700. That I think would be a good match for it. Um, oh, come on, brain. Come on. What else did we do as Class D? It was really good. No, not not coming to me. But anyway, the PS Audio is is one of the best Class D amps in the world. But we measure. I think the vinyl revival is going to help in that regard because right now it's, a, it's people making a fashion statement to some extent. They are showing that they are cool by buying LPs. But of those people, there's got to be a percentage, 5%, 10%, who say, well, there has to be more that I can get from my LPs that I'm buying. Um, local dealers. If they can reach out to those people, then the industry has a future. I don't know how they can though. I mean, we, we are trying to reach out from our position with the videos that Janet does for us, with the website, with the social, social media engagement, and we have about 72,000 followers on Facebook right now. We're trying from where we are, but it is the retailers of which sadly there are fewer than there used to be who are in the front lines for that for that outreach and I don't know how they're going to do it to be honest. Well I I reviewed Apogee Scintillas back in 85 for Hi-Fi News, and actually they re recently reprinted my review. I had visited Jason Bloom in, in Boston in 85 to hear the big ones. Um, amazing loudspeakers, but flawed, magnificent but flawed. The KLH-9s I only ever heard once, they never made their way over to England at the time they were available. Um, flat electrostatics always have a problem that they are a one person speaker because of, because of their very narrow dispersion. And I think of the electrostatics I've heard, the original quad, which had a very narrow treble section, had better dispersion. The Quad ESL 63 was the best multi listener electrostatic you can get, other than the fact that its bass was just idiosyncratic in the end. I mean, Sam Telling, who used to have a columnist, he used, to, he used to buy a pair of ESL 63s, use them for a year, and then get so annoyed at the base he'd sell them. And then a couple of years later, he'd buy another pair and go through it again. I think, you know, it's, so KLH has had that problem, one person speakers. The Apogees, magnificent but flawed and very hard to drive, very hard. The amplifiers were just, you know, they let out the magic blue smoke trying to, to drive them. I, I recently had a, a sort of an experience which disturbed me. So, Herb Riker, the writer, had written about the AudioQuest 1000 power conditioning. It's not a power conditioner, it's an 
It's an AC strip that has some filtering in it and so on. And he liked it, so he gave it to me to try it. I said, oh, hmm, okay. And that had, everything got cleaner, and I thought, well, I, well, I have very good electricity. I have, when, when we bought the house, I had new wiring put in, I have 220 amp circuits right behind the stack, they go straight to the meter box, very, very short paths to the electricity coming in from the street. But it made a difference. So I asked Audio Quest to lend me their next model up for 5,000. And that made an even bigger difference. And I'm still trying to work out why that should matter. Um, so yeah, that to be explored. Cables, there are some stupid expensive cables out there and I don't understand how a purchase can be justified in the sense that well, let's say, let me give you an example. A few years back, I did like a vertical tasting of Nordos cables, starting with the cheapest, going up to the top, holding. And there was a difference, and there was an improvement. But by the time you got to the between Valhalla 2 and Odin, which you're talking tens of thousands of dollars, the difference was tiny. And I would think, okay, well, if I was going to have Nordos cables, I'd back off down the line to the point where I st stopped hearing a big difference and started hearing small differences. Um, with cables, cable company does a does a loaner program where you can try out cables. I think that's great. Try out the cables if you don't hear it. If you try out a pair of expensive cables, if they don't make an improvement in your system, don't buy them. But you, at least you can try them. Um, it's a it's a difficult one. Cables. I'm using a very old pair of AudioQuest balanced interconnects right now, and a pair of very old pair of AudioQuest speaker cables which I bought years and years ago. Um, I use, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult one with, with, with cables and accessories. And also, whether or not they make a difference is going to be dependent on other things in your, in your district. If you live next to huge amounts of people pumping out Wi-Fi, then maybe some cables will be better at rejecting that RF energy than others. But that will be only true of you. There's no, might not be true of somebody else who lives in the middle of um, North Dakota hundreds of miles from anywhere. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, my current, my current wife, we've been married for 30 years. When I met her, she was working for audio magazines and she just bought a pair, audio magazine, she just bought a pair of BMW 801s. So, well, well I, if I marry her, I can get those. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell her that, don't tell her that. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I, and I mean, the quads I had, when my second wife left me, she took those quads with her. <coughs> Darn it. <laughs> the stereophile recordings are actually my invention, not the magazines, and I, I lease the masters to the magazine, but I've stopped doing them because no one buys CDs anymore. And you know, it costs quite, it costs several thousand dollars to for a recording project, and I'm looking at the sales curve of the CDs we've already done. And I'm thinking I'm actually never going to get that money back, so I stopped making recordings for Stereophile. Um, other than some cases, the most recent one was we did do we released Tightlines by Sasha Matson, but he actually bankrolled that project. Um, I've been doing recordings for other people because I I feel it's. It keeps me in contact with live music. It keeps me in contact with what you need to do to capture real sound on a recording. It's, um, you know, various metaphors have been going. You're capturing lightning in a bottle. You're peeling a butterfly to a wheel. It's not, photo recording music is not photography. What you're doing is using every artifice you can think of to convince the listener to your recordings that they were there. But that involves a lot of artifice, a lot of art. It's a creative process. And I've been doing it. I mean, <clears throat> I bought my first system in 1968. But actually, I bought my first tape recorder. I didn't buy it. My mother gave it to me as a present in 1965. It was a grunting mono recorder. And as I, as I told you, I was playing the violin. I was playing in, in that band with, with big ears. And she bought me a recorder so I could record my band, record my playing. And I've been recording ever since because it gives me that contact with how do you do it? How do you capture the lightning in a bottle? How do you 
But how do you know what's in the grooves, in the pits, in, in the bits on the file to get it come out of your system? And I still do it. I did, the most recent recording I did, well, most recent, I, we actually did the sessions in Portland, Oregon in 2016, was of a Portland State Chamber Choir doing all works by the Latvian composer Eric Sessenthals, who's like 38 years old and a genius. I hate him. And, <laughs> but this recording, the choir was on tip top form. Um, Ethan Sperry, big music director, had really gotten to that point where they were totally into, totally owned the material, but not so far that it became stale. And Eric Light, a friend who writes for Stereophile, who's also now the core director of um, Corleone in Vancouver, British Columbia, he and I recaptured that sound. The album came out last summer on Naxos, and it was number one on the iTunes contemporary classical charts for two months. It was number one on the billboard charts for, for, for like two weeks and then stayed above number five all through September. That was so gratifying because we captured the lightning in a bottle and people recognized it. That was the last big project I did. Ma'am, how did you get into it? You're, there's a lady two rows in front of you who's cracking up. What was your experience, man? Well, I just wanted to sound more. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I think that's what I I said my wife had the BMWs, but she also had a huge record collection. And um, we, we were talking just recently about, but what are you going to do? What's going to happen to all these records when we're gone? I mean, a horrible thought struck me. I have 22,000 tracks on my hard drive that I now listen to. And if I die, I said, what are you going to do? She said, well, I'll just, I'll just put that into recycling. I said, no, that's my collection. <laughs> Yeah, to give you guys some background, last month, um, Sterifile and its sister magazine, Sound and Vision and Shutterbug, we were owned by a venture capital company who had bought us in 2013. They owned Automobile, Motor Trend, Snowboarder, Surfing, a whole lot of different magazines. So we didn't know why they bought us. Why would a venture capital buy a publishing company when publishing company, you know, it's, it's no secret that publishing is having a hard time in the age of the internet. So anyway, the publishing company last fall decided, they had a big town hall meeting and said, we're going to sell you all. We don't want to be publishers anymore. We're tired of that. So, um, Stereophile was bought by an English company last month, a company that already publishes Hi-Fi News and Hi-Fi Choice. So, in a sense, it's a closing of a circle for me because I was 10 years at Hi-Fi News, 76 through 86. And my, now, my new boss is a man called Paul Miller, who used to work for me, used to be Sterifan's technical <laughs> editor. So it's been sort of an uncomfortable transition because the new owners obviously have ideas of what they want to do. And my goal is to keep doing what I do without interference. And we've reached an accommodation basically that I will keep doing what I'm doing, the way I want to do it, with the writers I, I've put together, with the kind of content I want to do. 
And as always, as long as my numbers remain good, I will be able to continue to do that. Let me tell you a tale. I became the editor of Hi-Fi News in October 82. And as I said, I subsequently learned that it was because the owners, the magazine was doing so badly, they thought, well, we can either close it, let's take a while, you know, throw a wild card and hire Ginger Atkins. So I did my first two issues, and I went to my publisher, Colin Gannon. I said, Colin, you haven't asked me anything about what I'm doing. And he said, why should I? And I said, well, are you concerned? He said, no. As long as your numbers are good, I never want to talk to you. And I thought, well, there's a moral there. So ever since then, I worked very hard to make sure that stereo, first I find news and now Stereophile's numbers are good. Not in any underworld way, not in any unethical way, but I am always looking over my shoulder. Is there something we're doing wrong or something could be done better? And I like to think that I will spot that problem before anybody else and will put the fix in before anybody else has noticed. Hence the numbers stay good, hence I can keep doing what I'm doing without interference from, for want of a better word, not with my new owners, but from previous owners, one would politely refer to as corporate ninnies. <laughs> so you have my assurance that you will not see any, any cha major changes in stereophile other than the usual evolution of what we do to respond to changing times and circumstances. I give you my word on that. As long as I'm here, that's what you'll be able to You'll be able to keep enjoying a stereophile which gives you the news. Thank you. I think we're out of time, so I'd just like to say thank you all for coming. Thank you for reading Stereophile. Have a great show. Thank you.